This week on The Aviators, Curtis finds out what it's like to be at 30,000 feet with no oxygen as he steps into the Embry-Riddle High Altitude Lab. Now, this is designed for a two-year-old. <laughs> we take you out onto the tarmac at Love Field as we show you the ins and outs of commercial flying. Sure, you've been a passenger, but this is commercial flying like you haven't seen before. Earlier this season, we took you inside the last flying B-29 bomber, Fifi. The B-29 was one of the first mass-produced aircraft to have a pressurized cabin. Today, aircraft of all sizes use pressurized cabins to safely transport people at altitudes where there just isn't enough oxygen for us to survive. But what happens to our bodies without oxygen? And what would happen if an aircraft lost pressurization at 30,000 feet? To find out, Curtis is heading back to school as he ventures to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. You know, we have a lot of degree programs, number 40 degree programs, but I don't think any are as well recognized as our aeronautical science degree program where we prepare uh, the next generation of, uh, of pilots. 23% of all the professional pilots in the United States are trained at Embry-Riddle. A modern pilot flying a large uh, commercial airliner, they have to have an understanding of computers, computer science, programming. They get training in a normal barrack chamber. We're the only uh, aviation school in the world that has its own normal barrack chamber that teaches students how to perceive or have sensation when they are developing hypoxia or oxygen deprivation. 51 north of Ormond. While Curtis isn't training to become a commercial pilot, he is going to experience hypoxia firsthand in the university's high altitude lab. Guiding Curtis and five other students through the process will be physiology professor Glenn Harmon. We learn about it as pilots when you're getting your license. For our viewers who may not have gotten their pilot's license yet, can you describe what is hypoxia and why it's important for pilots to know about? Hypoxia simply is the a lack of oxygen in the body. Uh, so that means for whatever reason, low pressure or low oxygen content, uh, your uh, um, blood is not able to assimilate or carry as much oxygen as it normally does. Okay, number two, anything? Think Hello? Well, the typical symptoms that you see with hypoxia uh, are very similar to being inebriated or intoxicating. We have lightheadedness, we have dizziness, a feeling of euphoria, you know, where everything feels very good. And the threat is we usually don't recognize that there's a serious problem. So we're just getting ready to go in the chamber here. Everybody is actually lined up in the order that we're going to sit inside. It's important there's an airlock in between here, so it's important that we all get in and get in quickly um, so we don't actually re-oxygenate the room, which would diminish the, um, the effects of hypoxia that we're going to experience this morning. You talked about the ability to experience hypoxia for yourself. Why do you think that's important? It's important because uh, being able to actually experience your symptoms, to feel what it's like in yourself, is the critical thing because now you and I would know what our personal symptoms are. It's one thing for me to give you a list of potential symptoms, but you don't know exactly in what order those are going to come on or how strong they're going to be with you. Once you experience that, uh, then you will know, oh, this felt different than what I normally feel on the flight deck or in the cockpit. And so that's the whole key thing of being able to feel it and to recognize what it is, and then of course, put the oxygen mask back on before you become incapacitated. With their masks off, the students experience the same oxygen level as roughly 30,000 feet in altitude. While their masks are off, the student's blood oxygen level is monitored using a pulse oximeter. What would, um, what would you do if you were experiencing this right now in the aircraft? Okay. What would be another thing to do then? Number three? The mask. 
One of the prime visual symptoms of hypoxia is cyanosis, a bluing of the skin, particularly visible in the fingertips. I'll help you go ahead and put your mask on at this time. Once their oxygen masks are back on, their blood oxygen levels very quickly return to normal, and the symptoms of hypoxia dissipate rapidly. After watching several other students experience hypoxia, it's Curtis's turn to remove his mask and experience it's oxygen really right deprivation. It feels pretty normal. Um, however, I wonder what's been happening since we've been sitting here. But once again, about 26,000 feet, certainly, you can get hypoxic. And Curtis, you can uh, also relate these symptoms and everything that you're experiencing to flying your, uh, your own aircraft uh, at the high altitudes there. While this lab is designed to simulate altitudes above 20,000 feet, regulations require pilots who fly above 12,500 feet to have some sort of oxygen supply. In fact, it's strongly recommended that above 10,000 feet, the pilot and passengers should wear oxygen masks. And you're about to see why. Emergency landing without engine power. Okay, here you go, okay, Jody. It's right here. Passenger seat backs, most upright, six C5 knots, touchdown, slightly tail idle, cut off. Gosh, oh, I hope we have lots of altitude. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Yeah, you finally got through that. But this is an incredible experience because you may recognize the symptom of hypoxia in one of your. Your, your crewmates or, or another person before you really recognize it in yourself. And that's probably a good idea at that point to don your oxygen mask and then start talking about it. Basic motor skills and the ability to process simple puzzles are also reduced while hypoxic. 12 plus 7 is uh, 21. So I'm going to have you take your mask. Just hold it to your face. All of these was almost blue. One of them is purple and one of them is actually green. Now this is designed for a two-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that smart. The interesting thing is, is you, you don't really feel like it's unsafe for you to have control of the airplane, which is a really interesting thing because, yeah, in my day job, I've got to talk to a couple of pilots who've had hypoxia, and it's really interesting convincing them to, to let's see, there you go, the switch is going. It's really ex interesting to experience because you have to convince them to, to descend the aircraft and then you want to keep a really close eye on them, especially because in both cases it happened at night and you don't want them to descend too slow. Um, they've got to catch the airplane at a safe altitude, like three or four or 5,000 feet where the oxygen is, uh, is more saturated. Yeah, there's my slurring. <laughs> Perhaps the most important thing to note about hypoxia is that the symptoms dissipate very quickly once you reestablish a steady flow of oxygen. This makes getting an oxygen mask on as quickly as possible a top priority. We know that your time of useful consciousness uh, up in the 40,000 range is a matter of seconds. I think they have an appreciation for the fact that they know they're always operating in that environment. So that there was a loss of cabin pressurization, uh, a window, a door seal that blows out. Uh, they realize what the threat is. It's a threat that's you know uh, going to uh, to occur in a matter of seconds. And now being armed with this knowledge and being able to know what it feels like, they would be able to reach grab that oxygen mask, put it on, and protect themselves and their crew, you know, immediately. It was a pretty incredible experience because for years you read about these things in books, but to actually experience it yourself and feel some of the sensations you get, um, the sense of euphoria is probably way more than I expected it to be, which is to say, I don't think at any point through that whole process I really had a, any fear about the actions I was going to take to alleviate the situation I was in. Um, but I think when we go back and play the tape back and I see what I was actually doing in real time, uh, my responses were probably pretty slow. While experiencing hypoxia in a controlled environment like the high altitude lab may seem like fun, it's even more importantly great training. But it's also something you'll never want to experience during an actual flight. After the break, we head out onto the tarmac at Love Field as we go behind the scenes of a commercial flight. One of the best things about having a pilot's license is being able to take up friends and family with you when you go flying. Aviation regulations actually require that you brief your passengers on emergency situations every time you go flying. A little bit of knowledge can go a really long way in keeping everyone safe. Remember, brief your passengers.
If you've ever flown on a commercial flight, and most of our viewers likely have, you might have found yourself with more than a few questions throughout the process. You may wonder what's going on with the plane before passengers board. And aside from loading bags, what are all of those people on the ramp doing? And what's that loud noise shortly after takeoff? Today we're going to attempt to answer some of those questions as we take a detailed look behind the scenes of commercial flights. To help guide us through the process, we'll be talking to Captain Barnes Pruitt and First Officer Ryan Haygood. As a passenger, when you arrive at the gate, you might already find the airplane waiting for you, or it might be coming in from another flight. Either way, you get to sit back and relax until it's time to board. But on the ground and in the cockpit, there's a flurry of activity. When the aircraft pulls up to the gate, the ground crew hooks up the airplane to ground power and also connects the aircraft to a preconditioned air system. And that's, and that's the way we try to be at the gate all the time with the external electricity and the external air conditioning, because obviously for efficiency use and uh, instead of using the onboard auxiliary power unit, uh, that will switch over to uh, here shortly. This is how we'll be all the way up into that point. If the pilots are taking over an aircraft from another flight crew, they'll find the airplane in a position where it's already started up and ready to go. It's got uh, ground power plugged up to it, so you've got pretty much what you see right here. I'm the first one to go get to the aircraft, the, the first officer is, and when I'm coming in, I'll start going through my what we call flows. Coming down here, making sure that the gear handle is down, the flaps are up, and then I'm checking the uh, fire system right here, which is also in preparation to start the APU. And it tells you that it's working. And then uh, when I'm finished with that, I go outside and do my walk around. Just like with any other aircraft, there's a walk around inspection. The co-pilot visually inspects the outside of the aircraft, the engines, and the wheel wells to make sure nothing is out of place. Once that's done, they head back up to the flight deck and continue their pre-flight procedures. On the ramp, the action continues. Bags are being unloaded or loaded, and the aircraft is being refueled and peanuts and pretzels and other provisions are being restocked. Overseeing everything is the operations agent, who you may see on the jet bridge. The, uh, the operations agent, if you will, the one that boards the uh, and gives us our paperwork, they're basically the quarterback of the team. They're out there, they're coordinating everything ends up in their hands and they hand up the paperwork to us. They, uh, they ensure that the, the baggage weight that's loaded is received from the ground and they put it into a computer that gives us our load sheet. Right. And so they, they make sure the passengers are on board and the counts are right and the correct you know, passenger counts are on there. Now once it's all together, they basically hand it off to us and say, you're good to go, here's your numbers. The door closes and then it's, up, then it's in our hands from there. During all of this organized chaos, passengers are boarding the aircraft and getting settled. It would also be around this time prior to pushback that the pilots will start up the aircraft's auxiliary power unit, or APU. When you get to an aircraft from the outside and it sounds like it's, it's running, <laughs> it's not the big engines that are running, there's a, a small jet engine in the tail of the aircraft. It's essentially, it's a small jet engine that uh, has a generator on it and it, it supplies all the electrics and the air for the aircraft on its, on its own. So we don't need any exterior services to help the airplane get started and going and we can do everything on our own. We just choose to do it because uh, it saves on in fuel and wear on the, uh, on the APU at the, when it's at the gate. Once the APU is powered up, the ground crew disconnects the ground power and ground air. This all takes place as boarding is being completed. About the time that we're, that we're turning the APU on is, is when they're finishing up the loading, you know, getting the cargo doors closed, the uh, loading belts will be pulling back, uh, they're, they're getting the tug hooked up, the guys are getting down there getting their, uh, getting their headset hooked up, and they're talking to us, and we're coordinating for pushback. Once we get all the numbers put in uh, from the OPC, then I'm calling uh, ground control, requesting a pushback if it's required at the airport that we're at, and they'll uh, make sure that everything's clear behind us. He's talking to the ground crew, and um, they push it back from the gate. When the aircraft is secured and all of the passengers are on board, the aircraft will be pushed back from the gate. Flight to push off door number one. Yeah, that's it. Southwest at gate one, push back approved. Advisory taxi taken call sign. Southwest 510. 510, thank you. A tug is used to push the aircraft back from the gate and turn it to a position where it will be able to taxi forward. 
we'll normally do is we'll, uh, during pushback, we'll just coordinate and they'll say you're clear. And we'll start the engines while we're being pushed back. And uh, we'll start both engines from there. We'll stop, clear them off, and then we'll just taxi on our own power out of that. As a passenger, you may be able to hear the engine starting during pushback, or you might notice the lights flicker. Once the engines are started, generators on each engine provide the aircraft's main power. The pilots will switch the aircraft's power from the APU to the engine generators. There's two, Tug. Stand by. Flaps. High five. Control check. Control check. Four taxi. Four taxi check. Electrical. Generators are on. Heat of heat. On. Any ice. Off. Start switches. Left continuous. Flight controls. Free. Start levers. Idle. Flaps. Five green light. Transponder. TARA. Recall. Clear. Four taxi check complete. Alpha Squirrel 6, we're ready to taxi with X ray. While the aircraft is taxiing, the captain steers the aircraft with a tiller. Four picture, we're going through right. Thanks to you, Charlie. Cross one eight. Cross one eight, Charlie one three right. Alpha Squirrel 6. At the same time, they'll be coordinating with an ATC ground controller as to where they need to be going. Between the captain and the first officer, whoever is not controlling the aircraft will be the one talking to ATC. We, we literally, either one person flies the aircraft while the other one works the radios uh, and initiates things in the computers, and the other person uh, is just flying, because one person only, of course, needs to be the person that's flying the whole time. And if it's my leg, leg I'll be flying, he does everything, and then if it's the other way around, he'll be right. flying, and then I will do all those other things. So we literally just swap roles, if you will, mm. uh, each, each leg. If you're a passenger seated over the wing, you'll notice the flaps extend prior to takeoff. This helps the aircraft generate lift at the lower speeds. Once we get to the end of the end of the taxiway, where the runway is, uh, the tower will clear us on, and the runway clears for takeoff. Southwest 201, left tower, runway 13 right, clear for takeoff. 13 right, clear for takeoff, Southwest 201. Clear for takeoff, 13 right. Once it gets lined up, the runway gives over to me. I push these up to the predetermined takeoff power setting. We're going down the runway, and once we hit the uh, predetermined speed, which we call uh, V1, that means we're going regardless of what happens. Shortly after that is uh, V rotate, and then we bring the nose up, take off. After takeoff, while the aircraft is climbing, as a passenger, you're likely to hear and possibly feel the landing gear retract. Ready to up? Positive right. Ready to go. Once again, if you're over the wing, you can see and hear the flaps retract as well. When we return, we find out what commercial pilots do during long flights. And while the passengers get to relax during the en route phase of the flight, the pilot and co-pilot are kept busy on the flight deck. Now, pretty much once we get, we, we climb out, obviously we're talking air traffic control and they're, they're hand, handing us off from the tower to the departure approach um, controllers up to the center, low, lower altitude center to the higher altitude center frequencies. So we're coordinating all of our climbs with, uh, with the controller, as well as them telling us to, to fly to certain points on that departure and, and on that en route part. And then once we get up to our cruising altitude, we're monitoring our fuel, we're monitoring our navigation, we're talking air traffic control, they are monitoring us and, and uh, handing us off to different frequencies along the way. Uh, just like again with any airplane, uh, we're just doing that. Monitoring the air conditioning, you know, monitoring pressurization. Mon you know, we're, we're, it's a lot about monitoring. Some viewers may have noticed that our interviews are not in an active cockpit. With security as it is, it's just not possible to film in an active cockpit. So this was shot in both an aircraft in maintenance and in a full motion simulator. Some older viewers might also remember a time when kids could visit the cockpit during flight. Again, that's unfortunately no longer possible. It's just fact ever since 9-11, uh, 
uh, with the security precautions that we have to take in today's world, um, you know, that's, that, that's not, not anything fun about that. And yeah, there is a certain amount of uh, separation you feel from uh, we, uh, what we used to have. To help relieve the separation between pilots and passengers, Southwest has a program called Adopt a Pilot, where pilots will head out to local schools. Induced drag, okay, induced drag. Well, Adopt a Pilot is a program that uh, we do here at Southwest. Pilots are assigned to a, a fifth grade class, and uh, that pilot will go and explain everything from aerodynamics to a lot of the things we talked about today, about how airplanes fly, what you know, how they take off, how they land, uh, the systems. They'll talk about uh, what a schedule for an airline pilot is all about. The, the class will actually track that pilot as they go on trips, and then they'll come back and uh, periodically, uh, and they'll talk to the classes. Uh, and it's just a, it's an interest as far as uh, obviously. Uh, you know, um, it's just good interaction between uh, uh, getting the inspiring minds uh, going and the, and the pilot group. So then call yourself ahead. At the point where the captain or first officer announce to the passengers that they're beginning their descent, the aircraft is usually about 120 miles out. And at that point, we're, we're getting everything uh, planned and briefed, which runway would approach, what the requirements are. If the weather's very, very low and it's a half a mile visibility, well, we have certain requirements. We have to make sure that we have the, the appropriate approach for that, for that runway. If the weather's higher, obviously, we can do visual approaches, which are, uh, we don't have to have as many requirements for that. But we're planning all that, and we're also going through more checklists. We have descent checklists that we go through. And again, just like before you take off, on the way we have descent, we have before landing checklists that we go through to ensure certain things. And, and throughout that whole process, we're getting closer and closer. And we're actually within about 15 miles of the airports when we actually get on the approach to the runway itself. Once again, as a passenger, during the approach phase, you're going to see the flaps extending and at some point hear the gear go down. So landing gear down. Let her down. South Uh, he'll coordinate with ground control on our taxi route uh, and, what, and we can verify with the company which gate we're going to and then we'll pull in and uh, uh, typically the safety zone will all be clear. There's an outline of that zone coming up to the gate. That means all the baggage carts are out of the way and no fuel trucks or bags in the way and then we'll, uh, we'll pull right in there and, and stop and set the brake, shut the engines down and uh, open the door, let the passengers off and start the whole thing over again. Choreograph chaos <laughs> starts again. At the gate, everyone is going to be rushing to get off and get their bags. But if you take a second to look out the window, you'll see that organized chaos back in action. And next time you see it, you'll have a better idea of what they're all up to.